Welcome to the Champs App Podcast, where we help players and parents demystify the world of minor hockey development and recruiting for both girls and boys. On today's episode, I talk with mental performance coach, Dr. Colleen Hacker. Dr. Hacker is a professor of sport and performance psychology and a six-time Olympic mental skills coach, including the U.S. women's hockey team for the 2014 and 2018 Olympics. We discuss a variety of mental performance topics, including developing confidence, handling sensory overload, and being a team player. This was an incredible conversation with Dr. Hacker, so I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Before we get to this amazing episode, I wanted to give you an update on Champs App. We continue to make enhancements to Champs App, and this year we will be adding some amazing new features to help with your hockey journey. Champs App is a digital hockey network. With Champs App, you can create a beautiful free hockey resume. Whether you are a hockey player, team coach, development coach, parent, or advisor or agent, you can create a personalized profile that fits your role in the hockey community. Once your free profile is created, you can connect with team coaches, development coaches, parents, and players. No matter your role, you can now add key contacts to show everyone who the key folks are that you work with, work with you, or are helping you out. It's like the LinkedIn for hockey. If you are a player, when you connect with coaches, they will receive automatic updates when you change your profile, add game video, or alert them to upcoming games on your schedule. Just go to www.champs.app and click the sign up button to start your profile. You can check out the full list of the NCAA coaches using Champs app by clicking on the links in the show notes. We also have more exciting features coming soon to help you get noticed in time for the upcoming recruiting and training season. Now, let's get to this amazing episode. I'm very excited to have on the podcast Dr. Colleen Hacker, who is a professor of sport and performance psychology at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Hacker has been a mental performance coach at the professional, international, and Olympic level for far too many athletes, teams, and leagues for me to list, but they do include the U.S. women's national soccer team that won the 1996 gold medal and the 1999 World Cup, and she was also the U.S. women's hockey team mental skills coach from 2011 to 2018 and won two Olympic medals, including gold in the 2018 Pyeongchang Games. Her most recent book, Achieving Excellence, Mastering Mindset for Peak Performance in Sport and Life, go into detail on what it takes to perform at the highest levels and provide specific competencies, tools, and examples to be the best you can be. So welcome to the podcast, Dr. Hacker. It's a pleasure to be here, Ray. I've looked forward to this uh, calendar date, so... Well, I really, really appreciate you taking the time and uh, chatting with me. Um, usually I'll ask people about their hockey background, but since I know you actually never played hockey, I'm going to just start with the most obvious question, which is how did you end up being a mental performance coach and why were you so drawn to excellence? Well, I love that. I mean, that's, those two questions are the, are the whole podcast, but let me, let me try to give you a, a brief answer. I was a three-sport high school athlete, a three-sport intercollegiate athlete. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to play two different sports through to the Olympic trials level. And, and the only reason I share that is I have a, a rich, broad, deep, and high-level competitive background myself. And what I learned early on, early on, Ray, is that I wasn't the tallest, the fastest, necessarily the strongest. How was I outperforming? How, how, were our, how was our blue collar team outperforming these thoroughbred teams? You know, you get what I'm saying. And I just realized, I realized very early in life that it was a matter of the head and the heart. I didn't have language around that, but quite frankly, there's, there's just a ton of people that theoretically have enough skill to play at the level they're at or the next level. There's that, that talent pool is wide. But what I see over and over and over again is that what weeds them out are the psychological components, the issues of mental toughness, handling adversity, not taking advantage of controlling the controllables. Um, you know, there's just so many psychological variables that are the difference. I, I talk to coaches. Very rarely do I hear a coach, well, I was just out coach. We just didn't have an answer. Very rarely does a coach say, yeah, I, I should have worked on that particular skill. We'd never worked on that skill before. Coaches don't feel like they've been out coach or their team isn't prepared. But I think for many coaches, it's a, it's a game of roll the dice on which which personality 
which skill their players are going to bring on a given night. They see them play one way in practice and a different way in games. They see them play one way against weaker opponents and then will against bigger opponents. So I think intuitively coaches come to realize how critical the psychological component is. I coached intercollegiately for 17 years, both at the Division I and the Division III level. So, so I come at my craft as an athlete competing up to Olympic trial level and as a 17-year intercollegiate head coach. And, and I just think that's an advantage. I think that's an advantage over folks that just have the, the degree, um, the certifications, but lack that real world experience. So it really was organic for me. Where did, so I'm curious, where, where did that curiosity come from and that problem solving nature to say, how can I break this down into its parts to figure out what really um, makes, you know, people perform at that highest level? Because that's what your book's I, all about is, is breaking it, it all is. down. Into components. It is, it is. And I appreciate you recognize that. And and in the book, and I hope we'll, we'll get a chance to talk about it, we really break it down on what you're doing, why you're doing, doing it, and then we actually give worksheets to say, make it your own. Like, you can adopt this individually. But to your question, I actually have, an, I have a partial answer to that. Where did that come from? What, how did... I've heard, uh, in particular, my mother, who has, who has since passed, but I've heard my mother tell this story my whole life, she said, you know, I, I, my first sports were um, equestrian and competitive swimming. And she said, when you were five years old, you used to go up to whoever was the best in the club, whoever was the best in the team, whoever was best at competition. You didn't know them. And you'd walk up and say, how did you do that? Can you teach me to do that? Um, where did you? I have been apparently curious about that and my entire life no hyperbole and I have truly been drawn to excellence for as long as I can remember in in the latter part of my career I think for the first 25 30 years I I tried to focus on achieving excellence and now these last couple years I'm more focused on sustaining excellence that's really grabbed my heart because there's a difference between shooting for the top, right? Which yeah. is highly motivating. And there's another thing to sustain excellence over time, which is related, but it's an entirely different beast. So both the process of developing excellence, achieving excellence, and then sustaining excellence, that's my entire career. That triad is my entire career. All right, so I guess I know what your third book is going to be about. All right, so uh, <laughs> um, we're going to get to your book in just a moment. Um, so I, I know, obviously, I mentioned that you had worked with um, the, the U.S. women's soccer team, had a huge amount of success there, obviously worked at the, the college level as well. Um, and I'm sorry that we don't have time to go into the details on any of those things because we're, we're going to jump ahead, though. Um, no how problem. did you end up becoming the mental performance coach for the U.S. women's hockey team? And obviously, we had Reagan Carey on the um, podcast a few months ago, um, and she mentioned you, and we'll talk about what some of the things that she mentioned. But I'm just curious how she, you know, uh, was able to bring you into the fold. I'll only share the good things that Reagan shared. Only share the good things. I'm, I, I'm teasing. I have enormous respect for her. Really, my answer to how did I get involved with hockey are those two words, Reagan Carey. Um you know, people talk about the 96 gold medal in the 99 uh, World Cup, but I was with U.S. soccer, uh, the national team, for 12 years. So three different Olympic Games, three different World Cups. So I was actually with the team uh, from pre-Atlanta, uh, pre-96, through to 2007. And then I actually joined hockey in, right around 2010, then official competitions in 2011. So there's just that little gap. Reagan had followed my work. She read the first book that Tony DiCicco and I wrote called Catch Them Being Good. She had read that. She had heard me speak, as I understand it. She she'd, um, used some of my quotes and some of my work. Uh, when she took over as general manager, not having, we'd never met before. And so she 
literally called me out of the blue and said, you know, I've taken over this position as general manager of USA Hockey. Uh, I want to ramp up what we're doing in the mental skills game. I, I feel like we have some of the best athletes in the world. I think clearly we have one of the best teams in the world, uh, but there's a missing piece. And so it, there was a little bit of, I said, you do know I've never played ice hockey. You know, I, I, I don't have a background in that particular sport, but you've, you've sort of seen my bio. I've worked across sports. I mean, I have NFL guys, Major League Baseball guys. I have Olympic gold medal swimmers. I, I'm, I'm fortunate to work with the best in the world at what they do across many domains. So learning the sport specifics doesn't unnerve me. Uh, the first thing I asked Reagan to do is send a bunch of film so I could watch and study and learn uh, just language and tactics and techniques. And, um, you know, it's an open sport. I don't want to get into the, into the weeds, but there's open and closed sports. Soccer's an open sport. Hockey's an open sport. Um, soccer is, is open play. In other words, I think somebody looked at NFL and even though the games last three hours, there's only 18 minutes of actual football, American football, you know, hockey is constant. Soccer is constant. Um, we're not calling timeouts like basketball. So there was a great deal that was similar. And that was you. extremely helpful for me. Okay, so we're going to get into details of some of the teams that you worked with. But um, as it relates to why Reagan brought you in, uh, she had mentioned that um, kind of your role in helping the team was they spent almost as much time training off the ice as they did on the ice, most of it related to, to mental performance. Maybe just talk about like how you know you and um, the coaching staff believed the importance of doing all this mental performance and, and why it was so critical to the team. Well, again, I just I just appreciate you adding all those folks. And and let me try to do this from an educational standpoint as well, is if you bring in a mental skills coach and they tell you what they're going to do, run the other way. I don't come in and tell them what they're going to do. I'm not there 24 hours a day. I haven't been with the team all this time. Neither has any any other mental skills coach. So my first role is to watch, listen, and learn. And so, Ray, you absolutely nailed it. I met with the coaches and say, asked them, what are the psychological strengths? What are the, what are the mental strengths that individual athletes, in your view, bring to the national team? What about the team's uh, commitment to high performance? What are their strengths? Where do you see the gaps? So I'm listening to coaches. I'm meeting with the captains. Because now they're closer, right? They're, they're the athletes. They're competing with their teammates. They know some things that coaches don't know, even though coaches like to think that they know everything. Now I'm meeting with the captains. What are you seeing as strengths? What are you seeing as hurdles that we need to overcome? And then I met frequently with the general manager who's there on ice, off ice, meeting with the coaches, meeting with the youth national teams, you know, there was real vertical integration. So my first job was watch, listen, and learn. I never went into a training camp or a competition where I said, this is what we're going to do. It was collaborative. It was constructed. It, it was fashioned with that particular team at that particular moment. Now, I do want to add, Ray, that 100% of the camps and I'd come into many camps throughout the year and then go to world championships with the team or go to the Olympic games with the team, you know, whatever it is. I wasn't full time like I was with soccer. I actually moved to Florida. I moved to California. I was in residency with soccer. Um, but I was, you know, part of, of uh, off ice, on ice, training camps and competitions. Uh throughout my eight years with, with hockey. Where I'm going with this is there wasn't a single time where in addition to the team meetings, so now every staff member's there, every athlete's there, and that was mutually constructed, what I just described. Then I also had individual appointments with whatever um, athletes wanted to schedule those. They weren't mandatory, right? They weren't mandatory. 
but I, I would say I ran out of hours before I ran out of interest. These are athletes, and this is one of the things I want to say uh, to the audience, is truly elite athletes are hungry. To the outside world, it looks like they've arrived. To the outside world, they look like they're at the pinnacle of their craft, and in many ways they are. But truly elite athletes know there's a little bit more or a little bit longer or a little bit better and they're hungry. So I didn't have something to offer them that they didn't have. We wanted to refine it, sharpen it. A phrase that I use with elite performers is performance on demand, that they know when they go into a training camp, when it's a selection camp, when it's world championships, whatever it is, that they know that they have put in the work not just technically, tactically, or physiologically. I don't know an ice hockey player that's not doing those three. I don't, honestly, I don't know a single ice hockey player that's not doing the physiological work, technical and tactical work. It's that fourth pillar that, that they're missing. It ends up being like an hour talk. Or we're bringing in an expert on Monday night from six to seven. And I, I don't even know what to say. Can you imagine, um, we're going to work on our penalty kill on Monday night from six to seven. And then that's it. You know, until later, we, we would never use that, that model in any other area, but it's very common in, in mental skills training inexplicably. So, so I would have team meetings every time I was in camp, a hundred percent of the time. And then individual appointments that were 30 minutes, 45 minutes or an hour, and that's where the athletes are saying, this is what I want to work on. I want to work on my self-talk. I want to work on my confidence. I want to work on my activation control. I can tell I'm too nervous. I'm too ramped up before games. I want to work on my concentration or refocusing. I want to handle mistakes better. Um, I want to start the period stronger. I want to start my shift at 100%. It, it's a it's hundred different each of those meetings is unique and distinct to the individual. I got it. Okay. So obviously you, you worked individually with some amazing high level talents in 2014 and 2018. So I'm going to um, set folks um, back to 2014 as to what happened there. Um, so the U S team were playing in the gold medal game against Canada. They were up by two goals with just a few minutes left in the game. And they ended up um, uh blowing the lead, basically, and losing in overtime. Uh, and it's quite dramatic. So, uh, but then you and at least half the team came back for 2018 in Pyeongchang. Right. Um, and they ended up, uh, you know, the Lamru twins basically kind of took over um, with uh, Monique, who uh, scored with just a couple minutes left, and then Jocelyn with the, uh, with the shootout goal. So here's my big question. Um, what did you do differently in 2014 versus 2018 to help get you over the hump and make that all possible? Yeah, and obviously that's, that's a loaded question. It that's is four that's, years of work, but that and that's part of it. Um, you know, I'm going to answer it in, a, in a, a number of different ways. For Americans, for Canadians, the Olympic Games are every four years. For Olympians, the Olympic Games are every day. They're every day, and 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 I think the audience needs to understand that we watch more in the Olympic Games. You know, in, in my eight years, it's two Olympic Games and six World Championships. So that, that's a lot of high-level uh, competition, pressure, drama. The Olympic Games aren't every four years. They're every day. So your question, again, is exactly right. We set out a plan. I, I, honestly, Ray, I think it was like within the, within the week of, of the silver medal in Sochi, I said to Reagan, I said to the coaches, the phrase, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. So if we don't change something, you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep winning a silver medal. That was, that was it. We knew we had to change. And there were changes tactically. I, I want to be honest about that. There were changes personnel-wise. Not everybody from 2014 was there in 2018. So there was a number of changes. But the part that I was responsible for, we also made changes psychologically in our mental skills game. 
This is too simplistic, but it'll be helpful. Because I came in in 2010, 2011, the Olympic Games are in three years, and they hadn't been dialed in, we meant well, we did good work, but I would characterize as we did too much all at once. You know, we were doing five, six, seven, eight mental skills, right? Across the year, year after year. So I, I, I joked it was sort of spray and pray. We sprayed them with techniques, strategies, uh, a new awareness, the ability to self-regulate. And we did that, but we did a lot in a short amount of time. One of the changes we made and I'm going to be blunt about the second one. One of the changes we made is we said of all the mental skills that, that we introduced them to and worked on in the four-year block leading up to Sochi, what are we going to dial in on? And one of those was on the use of imagery. So we used imagery in the locker room after practices, after games, where I led it, where the captains led it. We really doubled down on imagery because the research now is so clear because we have, we have the computer evidence to literally show athletes, here's a PET scan, here's an fMRI image of your brain when you're doing a skill and when you're actively and appropriately imaging the skill. And notice I'm using the word imagery and not visualization, which is mm -hmm. dated and visualization indicates that it's just with the eyes. Imagery is multi-sensory. So we doubled down on that. I'm gonna be honest now, it's enough years later, but I think the other psychological hurdle that we were facing is this feeling that Canada was always gonna figure out a way to come back. So even when we were in the lead, there wasn't this confidence lead. Even when we were ahead, there wasn't this certainty confidence. And so we also we also drilled down for four years that we can be ahead and finish ahead. We can be tie and grab the lead either in the third period or in overtime. And we can be behind and come from behind. So I think it was a four-year uh, gradual, and we did it in practice. We did it in prior to the Olympic Games. This regardless of whether we're ahead, even, or behind, we're going to find a way. We're going to find a way. And, and did you do and that did. by, did you and do that did. by, did you do that by simulating those situations in yeah. practice? Saying, okay, yeah. you're down by two goals and you have a power play. You need to, you, you got to score. You're putting on the pressure. Yeah. And yes. I, I do want to say, I think most coaches create that. Okay. You're down a goal. We need one. It, it, that wasn't unique that we simulated those scenarios. Most coaches put it on the scoreboard. They tell you how much time they have left. Like, I'm, I'm not downplaying that. That's critical. It's called pressure training. But that's already done. I'm talking about a mindset switch. Like, what are you doing? Our athletes said, you know, we were gripping the sticks a little bit tight when we went in the locker room in Sochi. You understand what I'm saying? Literally and metaphorically. They were gripping a little bit tight. Well, a tight grip doesn't make loose hands or fast skates or a confident athlete. So we really gave them skills and strategies so that they could do, so that they could do, and so that they could think about, and so that they could remind themselves. So it was action, it was thoughts, and it was language that in tight situations, this is what we're gonna do. Now, I'm not willing to give away those techniques and strategies, but you can't just, oh, we're gonna do it. It's not cheerleading. It's not just pressure training. There has to be a, a switch of a deep, embedded, learned and reinforced belief that we will find a way. And, and all that I will say is we did that Behaviorally, we did that teaching them actions to do in the locker room uh, when their shift ends. So during the game, in between periods, in between regulation and overtime. And as far as I'm concerned, the proof is in the results. I mean, yeah, the proof is in the results.
absolutely beautiful. And I suggest people go watch, you know, the highlights, the five-minute highlights on YouTube of the game, and you'll see how the team was able to come back, and it was a close game. And even in the shootout, it went back and forth. It was, uh, it was, it was not like a one-sided way at all, and and the the the, the outcome was not predetermined. That's for sure. Right. So uh, if you want to watch the 2018 highlights, so I do need to kind of move on to your book. I could talk to you just about the uh, the Olympic team forever. Um, and you mentioned kind of the four pillars of peak performance: technical, tactical, psychological, um, and physiological. So why is psychological um, the differentiating attribute of of success? Yeah, it, it just, well, the first thing is, why is it critical to train all four pillars? The first thing I'll say is, if you're not training in all four pillars appropriately, according to proper uh, evidence-based practice, you're leaving some of your talent and your potential on the table. That's what I'd say to every athlete and to every parent. Like, if, if your athlete is not consistently training all four pillars throughout their competitive career, from juniors to high school, club, national team, college, whatever it is, and doing it appropriately. I, I don't know if, if you want us to, to get into credentials. I, I'm living in a world right now where everybody's calling themselves, it seems to me that everybody's suddenly become a mental skills coach. And I, my heart is sick for the public because they don't know any better. Uh, I have a certificate in mental skills training. Well, that's not a thing. There's there's no recognized um, national governing body that you go online and take classes for 10 weeks. You might have a printout that somebody printed on their computer and you might have paid money to get that. But there are credentials and their credentials in Canada. It's It's worldwide now, but in Canada and the United States, the first thing I want to say is don't hire somebody if they don't have the CMPC designation, Certified Mental Performance Coach. If they're telling you, I work with elite athletes, I work in the pros, go, thanks, that must be a great career. What credentials do you have? So look for the CMPC designation. It's similar in Canada. It's just called differently. But I, I say to, to families and, and athletes, it's like a pyramid. So you want to have that CMPC designation. And then in the United States, the top of the pyramid is that you're also listed in the United States Olympic and Paralympic uh, Mental Skills Registry. And so for me, I'm CMPC at the PhD level, because it could be master's or PhD. So CMPC, CMPC at a PhD level, not just a master's. And I'm certified through the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. So there's real clear, simple, identifiable characteristics. Um, and, and I want to do that because I don't think there's enough education for the public. And, and so they, I'd probably be the same way. They believe them. Somebody tells them they're a mental skills coach. I mean, I guess I'd believe them too. Somebody tells you they work with elite athletes. How are you going to prove it otherwise? I'm just saying buyer beware. So, so to your question, you know, why the difference? I'm going to switch sports, Ray, and go to, to Major League Baseball, international sport, and I'm going to hearken. Uh, I, I don't know if he's a jokester or he's in the Hall of Fame, but if you know the name Yogi Berra, or if our listeners know the name Yogi Berra, he has some great one-liners. And one of, the, one of his one-liners, he's a, he's a Hall of Fame coach and a Hall of Fame Major League Baseball catcher. This guy is at the pinnacle of his sport. And he was asked, how important is the mental part of professional baseball? How important is the psychology in professional baseball? Yogi Berra has reported his, you know, thinking and goes, well, I'll tell you. Major League Baseball is 90% mental and 50% physical. And so you can argue with his mathematical acumen, but I'm going to tell you, I think he's right. I actually think he's right. You can, you can practice mental skills training till the cows come home, but if you aren't anaerobically capable and physically strong and have good technique and understand the tactics, it's not going to overcome that hurdle. Um, but there is no possible way that you could maximize your potential 
as an elite performer without a commitment to psychological skills. I think it is the pivotal differentiator. So um, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier in terms of how, how much work you did with the, uh, the women's hockey team. So what does it mean to be mentally fit? Um, you know, like, like how do you get to that point where you, that mental muscle is now really fit for performing in these situations along with the other three legs of the stool? Yeah, I love your questions, Ray, because it, it's just this beautiful segue. And we haven't met before, but I'll say to people, mental skills are just like physical skills. If you want to get better at anything, if you want to get better at anything, knitting, changing the carburetor, uh, arguing your case in a court of law, if you want to get better at anything, what's the one thing you would do? Practice, right? So there's myths about mental skills training. Coaches and parents, even athletes think you either have it or you don't. Well, all of us have a certain amount of strength right? All of us, not everybody's strength is the same, but we can all get stronger. All of us have a certain amount of speed. We don't all have the same amount of speed, but we can all get faster. You see where I'm going. So one of the myths is you either have it or you don't. Oh, he's mentally tough. Oh, she's mentally tough. Oh, you know, she's a real competitor. Oh, she, she shrinks. It. Those aren't those aren't some DNA characteristics they, that somebody has. These are skills. If you want to get better, train those skills under the direction of a trained, qualified person. So what are, the, what are the hallmarks? Simply put, I say to athletes, I want you to do two things. I want you to become more self-aware, just like I said to you before, performance on demand. I want you to become more self-aware. I'm not lacing on the skates. I'm not putting on the pads. I'm not out on the ice. You have to be self-aware and then you need to self-regulate. You have to have an answer for that. So if you realize that your nerves are getting the best of you, do you have breathing techniques, focusing techniques to get it under control? And I say to people, butterflies are great. I want butterflies on game day. I want to be amped, but I want to teach the butterflies to fly in formation, <laughs> right? So self-awareness, self-control, self-awareness, self-regulation. And that in a nutshell, what I teach athletes to do is to be able to self-regulate. Let's put you in charge of you. There's not one person listening to this podcast that, in my view, that's not that can't think of a time in a game where they're like, oh, my God, I just wasn't focused. Or, oh, I let a bad shift get to me the rest of the time. Or, oh, you know, I got reamed at after the second period by the coach and it just buried my confidence. All people go through that. Every athlete. So you're self-aware now, now roll up your sleeves, there's work to do. Maybe the simplest way is I teach them the work that they can do so that they're now in control instead of being subject to these external forces that most assuredly are gonna occur. And they're going to occur as long as they're playing hockey and they can't control it. Um, coach, if I play badly, I'd like you to just whisper in my ear what the, it, it, you're not, it's not gonna happen. It's not going to happen. Um, I'm just going to, you know, snap my fingers and I'm going to have a great shift every time on, on the ice. That's not reality. So you've got to live in the competitive world. And the competitive world is good shifts, poor shifts. Coach thinks you hung the moon. Coach doesn't know why you're wearing our jerseys this week. Um, you're winning. You're losing. You're beating teams that you should beat. You're losing to teams that you should be. I mean, this is, this, is, this is why we watch. This is why we love to play. So it's self-awareness, self-regulation. If I do my job, I'm kind of like the parent. If you do a great job raising your kids, you don't have to be there 24-7 because you raise them up to do, they know what they should do. That's, that's kind of, that's kind of how I see myself. I want to work with athletes so that they don't need me anymore. Now, having said that, 
because the mental skills, the mental skills game is always under construction. It, I have, I have professional athletes I've been working with for a decade. So on the one hand, I say they don't need me anymore, but the really greats are always investing. They know that it's not done. They know that they haven't arrived. They know that the mental skills game is always under construction and they're willing to do the work on that road. So you, you, you stole my next question, which is the confidence road is always under construction. Right. And, and so it's about believing you can, um, you know, as we start getting into kind of the, the competencies that you describe in the book. So how do you develop confidence? So, you know, I, you know, a lot of people think they do it by just um, practice and repetition, but that's not sufficient because sometimes you're not able to execute in a real situation, even though you've been practicing it. So what, what's the best way for players to develop confidence? Well, the best way is multiple ways, right? Is to avoid just one answer to that question. And, and, and I love that. You know, people think elite athletes are like perfectly confident or, oh, you've, you're two-time gold medalist. Oh, you're six-time world champion. You must be supremely confident. I, I think I surprise a lot of people when I say a vast majority of the elite athletes with whom I'm privileged to work, we're working on confidence. And, and I want everyone to hear this. Confidence is something that you have. It dips. You want to come out of it faster. I, I kind of use a, an analogy of a, a letter. Like, or how low do you go when you lose your confidence? How fast do you get back? How long do you stay low? Like, if it takes you an entire period to get your confidence back, we're, we're playing a player down. We're already... We're already in a in a uh, penalty kill situation. Like we don't have you. You're you've checked out. So, so the first thing we do is we call a spade a spade. That you're going to have confidence. You're going to lose confidence. You're going to have to work to get it back. So then your question is, how do we work to get it back? Multiple ways. Don't have one answer. Have multiple answers. The first thing you have to be aware of the the phrase I use is CTC. It's a shortened phrase for a phrase that almost every coach uses now, but it's control the controllables. You know, you can take a great shot and the goalie makes a great save. You can take a crap shot and it goes in. We, you know, most, most players have, have done each of those. And so what can you control? I can control my thoughts. I can control what I say to myself. I can control uh, what I'm focused on. I can control my work rate. But I can't control, and hear me out, I can't control whether I score or not because there's a goalie, right? I mean, I'm not 100% of the equation. You know, there, there's a goal. Um, you, you talk about Sochi. I mean, Kelly Stack sent the puck the entire length of the ice to an open net. That would have been the end of the game. To an open net against Canada and it hit the pipes. So, I mean, it's devastating, but how crazy can you get? It's like an eighth of an inch and you're wearing gold and an eighth of an inch you're wearing silver, but that's the sport. That's how, what I'm saying is, you get, first thing is control the controllables. Second thing in confidence is focus on what you can do. You have to know your strengths and it can't be 10 strengths or five strengths. You might say, you know, I'm really good on the breakout or I'm really good with this shot or this pass or this line. Know your strengths. And then when your confidence takes a hit, narrow it down and focus on your strengths. A third technique that, that we teach athletes, but you've got to practice this in practice before you do it in games. I call it go to your 80% game. When your confidence takes a hit, don't try to thread that perfect pass where everything has to be on and you might have done it. You might be capable of doing it. But when your confidence is low, go to the 80% success pass. Am, am I making sense on that? Like you have to know to shift, no longer go for that perfect, that perf, everything has to be great. And if I do it on the hero, uh-uh, 80%, 80%, 80%. Well, what happens when you're going to your 80% game and you're connecting and you're playing well and you're, 
letting the puck move, you get more confident. So by going to your 80% game, that's another way that you can gain your confidence. But, but accepting that confidence is always under construction. It's not terrible. It's not awful. It's not some awful shortcoming of you because athletes feel that way. Like, I know I need to be more confident. Ready, go. It's the equivalent of saying mandatory fun. Like, okay, Ray, start having fun. Now, go. You can't just will it. If you could will confidence, everybody would be confidence all the time, confident all the time. So we we try to do psychological strategies, we try to do self-talk strategies, and then behavioral strategies, as in go to your 80% game. So there's just three or four examples I might use. Gotcha. So you, you talked about like threading the perfect pass. And one of the challenges is in hockey is um, really a little bit of sensory overload. You have the puck, you're skating, you're looking around, and not only you have to figure out where your teammates are, you need to figure out where the opposition is. You got four, maybe five different um, attributes or, or pieces of information you're trying to digest at the same time. How do you kind of deal with that with in terms of being in the moment, being mindful of recognizing everything that's going on so you make good decisions or you're you able to complete, you know, smart plays? How, how do you yeah. deal with that? Because it, it's, it can be overwhelming, especially at hockey, which is such a fast sport. It, no question. And, you know, one of the things that I'll talk to athletes about is there's three points in time. There's the past, right? There's the future. And there's be in the now. Be in the now. Skate in the now. Play in the now. Okay, great. That looks great on a t-shirt. Easy to say, hard to do. But part of what makes overload is that athletes are often, often not just playing the puck that they have now. They're carrying the baggage about a turnover they made. They're carrying the baggage of a poor play. They're carrying the baggage of being down a goal and the team really needs this win. You with me on this? They're, they're, they're bringing in to this moment all of that back baggage. Or here they are on the ice, as you say, with four or five options, and they're bringing in the future. Oh, man, if I assist her and she scores, we win, we go to regionals. Oh, if I have a good skate, I have a good shift. Um, you know, I own this period. The college scouts are going to love me, right? We're in the future, right? So it's easy to say, but, but give athletes that example. And often I'll have, um, in hockey, I'll have them uh, tape two pucks together. So put one puck on top of the other and tape it with clear tape. So, okay. And then I say to him, all right, this sport is already difficult in the same way you described. You've got four or five options. It's happening at hyper speed. Um, you've got unbelievable pressure. So think how hard hockey is just being hockey. Now I'm going to have you play with two pucks. <laughs> And you know what? Hopefully you understand why I have them do two pucks. So here's this puck, and the other one is the past. Here's this puck, and the other one on top is the future. So do you want to play three periods with two pucks? It's going to be a little more challenging. It's going to be a little bit more challenging. Do you think you're going to be the same level of success, more successful with two pucks, or less success? So what I'm trying to say is I use examples like that to get buy-in. So one of the things we'll say is do simple better. Um, in some ways, hockey is a simple game made complicated by individuals. Do simple better. Play what you see. Let the puck move. We get so in our heads. We have busy brains. And, and then comes this paralysis by analysis. I didn't know whether to go to the wing or keep it or sit or what. what and you end up doing nothing, right? You end up, it's too late. Or you don't know what to do and you wait for coaching to come in, but by the time the coach yells it, the moment's passed. So just, just to really trust, do simple better, play what you see. Uh, those, are, those are axioms that can really help you in difficult situations. 
Perfect. All right. We only have time for a couple more questions. So I'm going to just hit on a couple of quick things. So one of the themes that you talk about is we before me and accepting a role and finding a way to win together. So, you know, one of the best, the best hockey player on the planet right now is Connor McDavid. His team has never made the Stanley Cup. He's been in the league seven years. Shows the importance of teamwork on, in hockey, especially. So how, how do you talk about, you know, especially at the youth level, about how do you – strike the balance between playing for yourself versus the team and trusting the team is going to be able to help you achieve your own goals. Yeah, you see me shaking my head, not especially at the youth level. At the youth level, at the intermediate level, and at the elite level. I'm just not going to let you say especially at. It is always a factor, Ray. It is always a factor. So let me let me tell you a couple of principles. I say to athletes, one of my phrases, and, and this was throughout my coaching career, and then I, I bring it to the mental skills coach. The first thing I say to a team is make a teammate look good. That phrase, make a teammate look good. Because when you look good, I'm not going to reference your NHLer, but but I encourage the audience to hear how you set this conversation up or this particular question. I can be the best guy on the planet. I can be the fastest gal on the planet. I can be the best female hockey player in the world right now. But if I play well, I've only done one thing. I guess it's better than playing poorly. I, I, you know, I'd be happy to be the best player on the planet right now. I mean, it's not nothing. I'm not discounting it. But when you play well, you've only done one thing. When you play well so that your goal is to make a teammate look good, do you see that synergy? So play to make a teammate look good. And a lot of people are very good individuals. There are so many sports where they have a superstar. I mean, they have not just a superstar. They have the superstar. It might be the NBA. It might be MLB. It might be the NFL. It might be the NHL. It might be women's national teams all over the world. Make a teammate look good. Now you've done two things and you've doubled You've doubled your impact. The second thing I'd say is the power of synergy. And, and I write about this in the, in the book. Maybe, maybe I was too influenced by Yogi Berra, but I say uh, in our book, one plus one equals three. That's what you're trying to get at, is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's not just enough to have six of the best people out there six of the best hockey players out there you want to have the best six there's a difference between the six best and the best six do you see that mind shift right it's true in rowing this is why you know th that i get to work in so many different sports because i can bring that sort of cross sport um pollination to, to new sports but, but you want to ha create a hockey team where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And a lot of coaches try to maximize the superstar, um, isolate and highlight the superstar, build up the superstar. That ain't, ain't going to do it. The one plus one equals three. And so we try to build on the synergy uh, with each other. You know, think, think if, if you look at my background, I, I don't want to name drop. I'll let my credentials speak for themselves, but look at some of the people that I've been privileged to work with. These are icons. These are generational talents, right? Their ability to see how their teammates are better at them than X, Y, Z, and to constantly be working. And, and understanding that we need each other, that I can't do it alone. I don't want to do it alone. It's not going to help me do it alone. This notion of he's carrying the team on his back. Well, his legs are going to get tired. She's carrying the team on her back. Well, they're not going to skate very fast. So we, we've got to let go of this superstar mentality. And, and I think I think we kind of like it. That's what I'll say. I think we kind of get drawn, you know, that neon light the whole is greater than the sum of its parts one plus one equals three make a teammate look good that's how we get buy-in 
Beautiful. Like I said, we can keep going on and on and on, uh, you know, another 20 different topics. So I'm going to ask you this one last question. So of all the teams and all the athletes that you've worked with, um, which one, which team or athlete do you feel you had the biggest impact on? Obviously, you, you would just be the catalyst because I know you're not going to take credit for anybody else's performance. But which one do you think you had their biggest impact on the success that you helped move the needle the most? Yeah, I mean, this is not just the media trained answer. I don't do this. I don't do this, Ray. I put high achieving people in position to do it themselves. So my answer to you is the great privilege in my life is helping incredible people, insanely talented people, eke out a little bit more of their capabilities and stay there longer. Who did and you eke out the most with? Who did you eke out the most with? <laughs> yeah, I, I tell you, I, I just... I view my role as a helper, as a facilitator. And so I, that's my answer. It's the privilege to help. It's the privilege to serve. It's the privilege to work with. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of end the way we began. I, I really want people to listen to this. Not the posers, not the self-anointed greats, the truly greats in sport. And I'm telling you, I bring more than a dozen sports to, to that sentence, they are hungry. Uh, there's another phrase I use is if you're, if you're green, you're growing. And if you're ripe, you're rotting. Think of it like fruit. And you want to be green and growing. And the truly greats are always green and growing. So are you hungry? Are you working? Do you see more areas that can eke out just a little bit more. And are you willing to roll up your sleeves and get at it? And that's what the truly greats do. All right. Well, I tried to get to get a name or a team out of you, but apparently I can't. So Dr. Hacker, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate you sharing your experience with the U.S. Women's Olympic team, with um, talking about your book and all the different topics that we were able to cover here. So once again, for, for folks who, you know, want to who want to find it um it's called achieving excellence um we're going to put a link in the uh, podcast notes but obviously you can find it on amazon so thank you so much for doing this my honor my privilege good luck good luck you've had some great great guests so uh it's an honor to be here i really want to thank dr hacker for joining me on the podcast she had great stories about the u.s women's hockey olympic teams some incredible insights on how to apply mental performance strategies to hockey and of course lots of practical tools that young players can adopt you can learn more about these topics in her book, Achieving Excellence. Check out the link to buy the book on Amazon in the show notes.